Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christiana Uneze. This afternoon, I will be briefly talking about guidelines on designing for accessibility um, in UX design and some of the things that you need to consider when you're building apps and uh, websites as well. And just a little bit about me. I have somewhat of a web development background, but then I have transitioned more into a user experience in visual design um, role now. I am currently a consultant with the CDC in Atlanta, and I do, <laughs> and I do a lot of uh, visual design as well as user experience. I do um, user testing for them, and I also work with multiple divisions on their accessibility, um, making sure that content that we post online meets the federal you know, government regulations because as the federal government, we are mandated to make sure that everything that we post you know, that's public facing is accessible to everyone. So that's just a little bit about my background and what I do. And so to get started, we want to talk about designing for a diverse set of users who interact with our products. When you are creating apps or um, creating content, the biggest thing with digital accessibility is making sure that what you produce is accessible to everyone. And everyone meaning people with various kinds of disabilities, there's visual, there's auditory, um, and different ways that people interact with the products that you create. So, and a big part of the user experience portion of that is the making sure that um, keeping human empathy and also the diversity in the uh, people that we create for, keeping that at the forefront. Because sometimes people look at when we create in, when you talk about accessibility, you look at it as more like constraints but those constraints help us to create better products, you know, when you're developing for, for people and those constraints help guide you as well to making sure that these things that you create is accessible to everyone. And that basically leads to a better experience for everyone, for the most part, who, who uses the products and the apps and the websites that you create. So, and the biggest thing that, you know, a lot of times people don't realize is, you know, why would you create products that are accessible to people? If you think about it, there's about 1.3 billion people with disabilities worldwide. Now, when people think about disabilities, they think of permanent disabilities. But there's situational disabilities and there is temporary disabilities. When you create a product for somebody who might be hard of hearing, that might be a permanent situation. But if you think of a situational limitation, so to speak, it can be someone who's experiencing your content in a loud room or like a bartender who can't really hear because of all the noise that's going on in the background, they would experience similar limitations, um, similar to someone who has difficulty hearing as well. And another thing is, about 20% of the population experience some sort of disability, and that includes you know, permanent, situational uh, as well. And so if you're not keeping accessibility in mind, you're almost eliminating about 20% of your population you know, or your user audience. So it makes it very important to keep these things in mind as well. Accessibility, better accessible apps and, and websites also uh, give you better user experience. You have better search engine results, you have a reach a larger audience, you have faster download times, and you can help eliminate lawsuits <laughs> as well <laughs> because now we are federally mandated to make sure that organizations, that the content that they're putting out are accessible to everyone. I'm not sure if most people are familiar Harvard is actually currently um, going through like a major lawsuit because a lot of their online learning content and online learning platform is not very accessible. So just in 2017 alone, there were over 814 website accessibility lawsuits currently on the way. So these are just some of the things, you know, the reasons why it is very important to make sure that the things that we put out online 
accessible. In addition to that, the main thing really to making your content and your apps and the websites that you develop accessible to everyone is that it eliminates barriers for a lot of people. If you think about people who have cognitive problems or who have poor motor skills and you're creating apps that are not accessible to everyone, that's, you know, you're not helping eliminate the barriers that they might experience as they use some of the things that we that we create. And also too, a lot of times people think that, you know, building accessibility into webs and apps is difficult. It's really not. It's just making sure that some of these rules and guidelines that have, you know, been set aside are kind of put in the forefront as you are developing and you're creating content. Because accessibility tends to be something that most you know, that kind of gets pushed to the side, like, okay, we will, you know, attempt to make it more accessible down the road, you know. But if you keep these things in mind ahead of time, it eliminates a lot of those, those issues that, you know, that we might have. Now, I kind of mentioned earlier about permanent and temporary and situational limitations, so to speak, that people might experience. For example, um, a device that is de designed for someone who um, maybe has lost a limb, you know, or would be beneficial to someone whose arm is currently in a cast. You know, that's not a permanent situation, it's more, you know, temporary or situation. If you think of new parents who are, you know, constantly holding a baby all the time, they have, they are limited to, you know, their motor skills. And so some of these things you kind of need to keep in mind, um, as well as a lot of mobile devices. Everyone is always, you know, on the phone these days. A lot of times when you're using your phone, you might be outside in bright sunlight. So your content, you know, has to be legible, you know, outside. You think about contrast and how all those things come into play. And these are not always things that we think about, right, when we're developing uh, developing apps as well. And so the various types of disabilities that we have, we have vision, which deals with light perception. We have people who are partially blind or, you know, fully blind. A lot of times uh, they would utilize screen readers. You have color blindness. People would use special glasses for some of those. And then we have hearing disabilities for people who have hard of hearing or hearing loss. A lot of times there's use of captioning and audio transcription services to make content more accessible for them. And then we have cognitive and learning disabilities. People who experience that might have a hard time with uh, memory loss or problem solving and paying attention. So when you have apps, you know, that require input, given making sure that you have enough time to for people to enter their responses, you know, kind of things like that, or apps that would require a lot of uh, the user paying attention a lot of the time. So, you, so those are some of the things that, you know, you might want to consider as well. And then, of course, we have physical disabilities, loss of limbs, or temporary broken limbs, or, you know, situational, kind of like holding the baby. So one thing to keep in mind is that making sure that your apps are accessible by addressing some of these things as you develop apps. It also helps a wider range of people, not just you know, uh, people who have permanent disabilities, but it helps a wider range of people. You go from you know, maybe uh, 20,000 people or so who have permanent disabilities and that extends to over millions of people who have either limitational or uh, temporary or situational disabilities that your apps are now more accessible to. So the main thing with making sure that your apps are accessible is though the web content accessibility guidelines are kind of the guidelines of their internationally known set of guidelines that have been created by WC3, which is the governing body. 
And so basically, this means the four main principles of these guidelines are that your content should be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Now when it talks about perceivable, it talks about, that refers to the senses that people use when they experience your, your, your product or your app or your website. And that refers to you know, the various senses, sight, sound, and touch are the main uh, senses that that refers to. So you wanna make sure that you are not limiting any of those in any way. People who have limitations that deal with that are able to still perceive your, your site um, or apps correctly. And then when it comes to operable, you wanna make sure that they are able to operate your site. So using keyboards, um, people who, uh, how your, your apps and your sites are able to easily navigate, you know, a keyboard or with a mouse, you know, you wanna make sure of that. And then understandable, making sure that anyone can easily understand your content, be it use of simple language uh, and just making sure that there are other options that are available and it's easy to understand and not complicated language that is being used. And then making sure that the site is robust basically means that a lot of third-party apps that are used for people with disabilities are able to accurately interface with your, with your site. So that is something that is also built in on the back end as well, you know, as, as you're developing. And then with the uh, guidelines, there are three main levels. There's the level A, double A, and triple A. Level A is really the, at the most basic form and triple A is the most strict level of the accessibility guidelines. Now, it is somewhat difficult to achieve level triple A um, compliance because that doesn't necessarily apply to everything, but for the most part, the double A level will make sure that you are in compliance with a lot of the, the government um, guidelines. If I continue, anybody has any quick question, want me to stop, repeat anything? I was just kind of quiet. Uh, most, most uh, if you apply the AA level, you will meet most government regulations. So AAA, a combination of AA and AAA would be great, but then it will also severely limit you know, how people can experience your site. So level A tends to be the level that most um, companies, you know, would go for. Um, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go through some of some more stuff as, as we continue, but um, there are reasons <laughs> there are resources available. I uh, would probably mention some of them at the towards the very end because there are websites that you can go to check for like contrast, you can check for color, you know, and then there is uh, the WCAG website, you know, has all these guidelines, you know, online and then based on what kind of role, if you're a content developer, or if you're a web developer, it kind of gives you very more very specific things that, you know, you would have to adhere to so you're not trying to figure it out, you know, on your own, so. Okay, and then I'm just gonna go over some of the main guidelines for some of the different content, you know, that, that we have online. And so guidelines for audio, video, and multimedia, which is like a huge part of online content. So we're talking about things like YouTube videos, online radio stations, TV streaming, and based on the video and auditory nature of these things, it can make it very difficult for people who have visual limitations, you know, to experience some, some of this content. So the big thing about that is, you know, some of the things that you can do is make sure like for video content you or you provide, the, the biggest thing about this is making sure that you provide alternative options for people. So if you have video content, make sure that 
their you know text transcripts are available and then the good thing with like text transcripts is they are indexable by the web so instead of having a video with a you know brief description if you attach a text transcript to that you know google can index that making that particular video more e easier to search you know online so that's one thing um, for like video content also uh, things like podcasts as well you know if you notice uh, some of the podcasts that you would listen to always would have like the text transcripts version so it doesn't just help somebody who has you know permanent disabilities you can you know it helps just by everyone else too and a lot of people I know with me sometimes I don't have time to always listen but sometimes I hear something and I want to go back and I reference that and I would go and look for the text transcripts because then I can search you know in the document so you know that's also one of the biggest thing is you know that content even though it's video audio now becomes searchable you know and then we have audio descriptions and these basically provide a description of the meaningful visual elements that you would see in like a video. So even though there's no dialogue for someone who can't watch a video, they can still, and there's no dialogue going on, they can still kind of experience what is being shown on the screen. Now I have this brief clip from The Hunger Games where there's no actual audio, um, there's no actual dialogue going on, but you can... Oops, 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 go back, go back. Sorry. So with this, you can see that even though there was no dialogue going on, in the video, the, the audio description is still able to make it, you know, easy to follow along as the, the video um, is playing. So that is also very helpful. And also this can be provided like as a separate audio track that, you know, um, can be referenced later on. And another big one is the use of captions. And I think we have all, you know, experience video contents where you're in situations where you have this amazing video, <laughs> but you know, you're like either in a loud space or maybe you're on the train and you don't want to be a bother to the person next to you and you're able to read, you know, uh, the audio that's going on. So use of captions, it becomes very important. And, you know, as the, the as, well, for us as the government, we are required to provide captions for all pre-recorded media. So that becomes, you know, very helpful as well. And then captions can be, you know, open or closed. So giving people the option to either turn them off or turn them on, you know, as needed. So that also is very helpful for, you know, meeting accessibility guidelines. Now, I'm sure everyone in here can remember Flash. <laughs> Some websites still do use Flash. Does anyone have any, uh, give us some reasons you might think that Flash is no longer, has been discontinued? One of the, you know, some of the main reasons why, anyone? Yeah, huh? It has a lot, screen readers too, you know. Also, Flash is, breaks a lot of accessibility rules. <laughs> So that is part of the reason why Flash is being discontinued and being phased out because there were a lot of accessibility problems with Flash. So um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of us already know that. Also, you know, when with webs, uh, with websites and, you know, with apps as well, be aware of moving content on the page because that can pose problems. So a lot of times when you have pop-ups, you know, you always want to give your users the ability to either turn them off or exit out of that. And then also be aware of content that has like a lot of flashing or, you know, constant movement because that can 
pose problems for you know people as well so you always want to give your users either the option to start stop or exit you know out of that content and also one thing that we've kind of stopped doing is having content that automatically starts when you open up a page because I'm sure there's been times when you've gone to websites and then all of a sudden you hear the sound but you don't know where it's coming from and you're trying to figure out what it is so you can turn it off a lot of times it's because content automatically starts when you go to a page and you know you want your users to have the option to you know either start on their own time or stop it you know right away when they want to so that's also you know something else and then color color is a big deal when it comes to you know accessibility what you might not realize is that uh, color deficiency you know red and green color deficiency is one of the big color deficiencies that we have uh, that exists in a lot of people and color is a main you know it's a main uh, part of visual communication but it can also pose problems for people so when you are creating content or creating websites, the biggest thing is to make sure that someone can experience your site or your app. If, you know, color is not, like color should not be a limiting factor because not everyone can perceive color on the same skill. Now, if you look at this image, someone who has red green deficiency would probably see a five. And, oh, I'm sorry, who, and those with red green deficiencies will probably see a 70. I'm not going to ask what anyone sees, but just to keep, you know, keep that in mind that uh, there are a lot of people who have varying degrees of deficiencies when it comes to color and not everyone can experience the full scale, you know, um, that color provides. So. And I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, not to use color as the only visual means of conveying information. You always want to make sure, even though that color has been used, but there are other visual clues available, you know, be it using outlines or, uh, you know, users should be able to understand all the information without the use of color. So a variety of links. Uh, maps, charts, navigations, use of headings, you know, labels, you know, those are all very helpful. So if color is eliminated, they can still understand if there's an error message, you know, they could still see that, okay, this is an error message and I need to address that as well. So let's see. And I think I kind of mentioned this earlier too, for guidelines of uh, when I t mentioned contrast ratios, this becomes very important for mobile apps because a lot of the times when you're looking at a screen and you're outside and the sun you know, is, is shining bright or you want to make sure that your apps are legible. You know, in, uh, so because of that, uh, contrast becomes very important. You know, I see sometimes we'll see apps and it's very hard to read the text. It's a beautiful site, but there is very low contrast in some of the text. It makes it, you know, very, very difficult to read. So just kind of like this example, I'm not sure if you can see the text that's <laughs> at the very top. This is actually uh, from a website, like that was an actual example for a website. So you know, contrast becomes very important as you um, develop content. And then one of the main requirements to, for the accessibility guidelines is uh, the contrast. And there are various tools available that, you know, you can use to check contrast levels. And I think the minimum contrast ratio for normal text is like 4.5 ratio to one against the background. And that's for like normal text versus like headlines, which has a higher contrast ratio. And like I said, there are various uh, websites that you can go to check the contrast ratios. And a lot of times too, like when I design or I create, I usually would have like a, 
a contrast checker or a color or a color checker, you know, just to make sure that there's enough degrees of, of contrast between the background and, you know, things in the foreground. So, you know, that's something else as well. And then also with that, user testing is very important because these are some of the things that you might want to also check as, you know, you're testing the site with, you know, users um, or your target audience and not just checking like that, I, in my opinion, it is part of the functionality, you know, that you have to check for, you know, with your users as well. So, and then I'm kind of going, am I going a little too fast or no? no? Okay. Any questions as I continue? Just, okay. Keep going. And then we have guidelines for images and non-text elements. This is also a big thing. Uh, there's a ton of images online. Now, with using, a lot of times you want uh, the images to be searchable as well. And so with that, you have to correctly tag these images. So let's say you have an example, uh, let's say you have a dog image and you just, you know, in the code, that image is tagged as a dog. Well, you can also add the kind of dog it is, you know, the kind of breed it is. So all these things make it easy for your images to be searchable online. So let's say this image has been described or image of a dog has been described to someone who is visually impaired. It will tell them if the image is tagged correctly and there's good description about it, it will describe to them the kind of dog that it is. You know, so situational and contextual description is also very important. So use of all tags, you know, as you're coding things is also very important. So this is really a fundamental part of, you know, making sure that all the content on your site is accessible. Yeah, you had a question? I, I mean, yeah, you can, because I think I'm going a little, I, I'm going a little fast, so you can kind of stop me. It's really up to the company. It really is, should be your responsibility because, um, you know, you want people to, whatever it is that you're putting out online, you want them to be able to experience it. So if you, let's say you're a small business, you know, and you, you know, sell things online, you want to make sure that whoever is developing your site is paying attention to these things because that's how you as a small business will be found, you know, online. So, you know, you want to make sure, and these are probably things that they wouldn't know, but you as developers really should at least be aware of some of these things. So are there specific roles to accessibility inside of organizations? And do you think that there should be? There should be. Yes. That's what I think. Uh, there should be. Uh, there should be rules for accessibility because what we're seeing a lot more now is that companies are getting sued, you know, because if, you know, I have some kind of disability or limitation and I come to your site and I can't access it or I can't use it, I can come after you. And your response cannot be, well, I didn't know. <laughs> You're still going to get sued. So it really is... Uh, it, there should be rules, governing rules within, you know, organizations, especially larger organizations, but small organizations as well. For us at the CDC, we are a federal agency, so we are mandated, you know, to make sure that everything that we put out is accessible. And even with that, it's a little difficult because a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, scientists or, you know, people that we work with, health professionals, they'll submit content to get posted and we have to send stuff back like, hey, you know, you need to provide descriptions for these things. You need, you know, the site is not, the, or your content that you're providing needs additional information to make it more accessible. So we'll kick stuff back. So even with that, even with being the federal agency, we even still struggle sometimes um, because that's just not something that everyone is aware of. So we're trying to definitely try to change that. You're hitting on that. So my next question would be, I'm 
I'm assuming these companies aren't doing this maliciously, but are they even self-aware to know that they need to be doing this? And if not, how do we get them to the point of not knowing what they don't know? That's, that's a tough one because a lot of times companies just don't know. Right. You know, so, and I think that is part of what you have, you should have, you know, the IT team to be aware of, or developers to be aware of. Like these are things that, you know, as our, a lot of the times, you know, the stakeholders are not aware of these issues, but it's up to us to bring it up. You know, as developers, we need to, so you can make recommendations and you can kind of point things out to them as well. Or also part of, you know, in, in testing your apps and testing your process. Sometimes what we do is we, you know, might record these things and then point it out like in meetings, hey, you know, in this user testing session, you know, we had users who had difficulty with this portion. This is an accessibility issue that we can get, by the time you mention, we can get sued for. <laughs> Usually they will pay attention at that point. It's like, okay, we need to address that. You know, so it, it's, and I think that's why it's, it's a big deal because we as developers, these are some things that we can advise, you know, on that not everybody is aware of. So does that kind of, yeah, yeah. okay, great. Okay. And then also navigation is a big deal as well. You want, you know, consistent navigation on your apps and, and on your site as well. One of the biggest things about making sure that your site is accessible is making sure that someone can interact with your site with a keyboard alone. So they have to be able to use the you know, arrows on the, on the keyboard to access the site. So what this means is that like the tab order of all your content you know, has to go from left to right, up, down, you know, and that's something you might not necessarily be aware of. I mean, even with documents, like we post a lot of documents online at the CDC, a lot of times if you try to access a document using a screen reader, it does not read correctly, and that becomes an accessibility issue. Um, so just, you know, like with your navigation, making sure like the length of the navigation, um, you don't have too many things in your drop down menu because each, when you're navigating a site with like, let's say a keyboard, it has to go through each level, you know, that gets read aloud to someone who's accessing the site that way, and it can become very tedious to listen to all of that. So, you know, that's, you know, something else that you want to keep in mind as well. And then you just consistency in the visual representation for all the pages, making sure that the different components are in the same place, you know, and that that is consistent so that for someone who has, you know, a short attention span or, you know, is able to remember, or if, I don't know if you've ever done, use a test where you have uh, people with like either cognitive issues or, you know, watching kids, let's say who have, who are autistic, trying to um, navigate a site and, you know, they tend to remember where things are. So that's, you know, something else that, you know, you might want to think about. So just having a consistent look and feel and functionality on, you know, all the different pages as well is very helpful. And then uh, visual order and, and focus is also very, very important, especially when it comes to using like a keyboard to access the site. You always want your users to know where they are on the site. So if you're using, let's say, a keyboard to navigate the site, as they go from you know, level to level or different aspects of the page, there should be some kind of visible element or something to alert them of where they are you know, on the page. So, you know, that also becomes very important as well. Just kind of like how you can see on, you know, some of these images, you can tell, you know, right away where the per where you are, you know, on the site uh, as you go through it and, you know, select different options that becomes, you know, uh, a little easier to notice. And then having, making sure that the UI components have like the same functionality you know, as well. And, and then two, users don't always land on your site through 
the home page. A lot of times they're being directed there, maybe from like search, you know, search results. So you want to make sure that they're able to, you know, find what they need as they go through, you know, and know where they are on the page as they go through it as well. Then we have forms. Forms is also another, um, another big one as well. You always want to make sure that you have use labels and instructions and you know the various form fields. Like if you look at this form right here, you know, you can kind of guess that your username should go up there. But if you don't know that, how do you know what information you're supposed to input? You know, so that's not immediately clear. And then for like this delivery from the restaurant, how do you know what's supposed to go in there? Is that your, your email, your address? So it's kind of, you know, becomes a little confusing. It's pretty to look at, but in terms of functionality, clarity, you know, it's, it, it's not immediately clear you know, what some of that information should be. And then also with forms, you want to make sure that you give users the option to review what they put in uh, and confirm all information that they enter before they, you know, hit that submit button. So another thing that I see that is used a lot is placeholder text. So let's say for this field up here, you know, they might have like a placeholder text up there that says, you know, enter username. But the, the issue with placeholder text is the minute you begin typing, that information goes away. So how does your user know sometimes by the time you get to the end of the form, you might have forgotten what you were supposed to enter in the first place. So use of placeholder text oftentimes is discouraged instead it's, you know, better for you to use like labels to um, kind of let users know, you know, what they should enter. And so the biggest thing or the biggest suggestion that I have is, you know, try to make accessibility um, a part of your workflow early on. So with that in mind, it makes you, makes us better developers because if you know that these are some of the things that um, we would have to address later on, you know, it helps you build better products. It helps you build easier to um, use and makes it a much better user experience for the majority of people. So by addressing one thing, you know, it extends to a larger audience making you, you know, have a better end product. And then also some of the WCAG principles that I talked about, it's a very extensive, <laughs> um, a very extensive and more in-depth guidelines that's part of the document that they recently updated in like last year or two. And a lot of it is focused really for developers, you know, so that's something you might, uh, want to look into if you're not already familiar with it. It does go into very, very great detail as to, you know, some of the things I mentioned are kind of like more high level. So it does give very specific, you know, like use of headlines and, you know, use, like it gives very specific numbers, you know, that you can access um, just to kind of let you know specifically, you know, what you should be doing um, to make contents more accessible. And then also kind of like I mentioned, the main thing is having alternative options for, you know, the content that you put out, making sure that if it's mainly a visual, uh, you have other options that people can access the site. If it's, you know, text descriptions or making sure that there's captions available for videos and other, you know, other things as well, but having more than one alternative way that someone can experience your site or experience your app, you know. So those are some of my, some of the recommendations. Now, I have, you know, question if anyone would like to share some of what they do in your workflow process. 
um, to make the sites that you develop? How do you address some of these issues? Are there any specific things with, within your organization or within your workflow that you do to kind of address accessibility issues? Anyone like to share? Mm -hmm. like accessibility guidelines. So if, if, from what I've gathered from this presentation, the, like the, as long as the internal apps kind of check the guidelines to make it, to hit at least like a double A, so can you use your the application by keyboard alone to have a minimum of 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio? Are there visual alerts telling you where you are when you're tabbing? Like that type of stuff, I think, seems will be make the biggest impact. The, it would make a, it, I, won't, I don't know about biggest impact, but it would definitely make an impact. Um, it would definitely make it a lot easier to, you know, use an experience of site. And I think a lot of times people think that it complicates the process or it clouds your design or layout, but it really doesn't. You know, because you want an app that, or you want a website that someone can use, because part of the user experience is making it pleasant and also it's usable. You know, so those are some, some ways that you can make it a lot more functional, a lot more usable, you know, for, for your users. So those would definitely help a big deal. Yeah. Do I have anyone else would like to share or concerns, questions, or you know, anything else at this point? No, everyone's just kind of quiet. <laughs> It's just very, very quiet. So for um, like the, the app that you, you know, you're developing, is it, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Does it have like a lot of video, a lot of audio? Is it mainly text? Is it, what kind of functionality does it have? Sure, so I'm in the healthcare market, so mm -hmm. I'm um, focusing on doctor's offices. We don't have a lot of videos. It's really um, like a ledger. Um, we're doing um, plain, well, um, electronic remittances. So once a doctor has been paid, how are they paid? Why were they paid? Mm -hmm. Being able to visually see what the monetary amounts were. And yeah. Um, now, is it is it mainly like a mobile app or is it like a desktop app? Desktop. Yeah. So for desktop, you definitely want to make sure that the contrast levels um, for like everything is you know readable against the you know, background. Uh, so that's one thing that I can think of. And then also making sure that like the tab orders, you know, are, are correct. Because if someone is using a desktop app, you want to make sure that they are able to, you know, go through it in the logical order. So those are two main things I can think of, you know, off the top of my head um, for something like that. So. Um, there are mobile rules because a lot of things are like now, you know, mobile. I didn't really address that here, but I can definitely give you some resources, you know, afterwards that you can. But the, the WCAG guidelines, like I said, is very extensive. So they're part of that, you know, I'm sure you can find, you know, guidelines on like mobile friendly stuff. So, yeah. No problem. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, that's fine. You had... Have a question? Sorry, I have to That's fine. Jessie up there, so she just talked to me. Um, I was concerned about, or should I be concerned? Icons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're using universal icons, but is there any viable way to find something around that? Like, what is the difference? Um, if you're using them as, uh, images just I think for the most part make sure that they're if they are 
a key component of, let's say, the page, and they add valuable information, then they should be tagged correctly. But if they're not, if it's just a purely decorative item, it can be tagged as a decorative item so that the screen reader, you know, that would read it knows to skip that because it's not providing valuable information. So in terms of like icons, it's either, if it's something that is key to them understanding what your content is, then it should be tagged and described that way on the back end. And if it's just decorative, then it should be tagged as a decorative item so that, you know, um, like a third party app would know not to read that. Yeah. Uh, so we should be looking from our back end developer that they have tags so screen reader can pick up. Yeah, so they can so it can be tagged either to be ignored or to be read. So you want it read. You want it read? Yeah. So then just simple simply adding, you know, uh, the correct tags in the back end to make sure that, you know, it's described correctly, you know, will be very helpful. But if it's something that's not very important or doesn't provide additional value to understanding the context of what's on the page, then it can be tagged so that it's, you know, it's ignored. So I guess that's the way I would address that. Um, <laughs> um, on all of the actions or buttons, should we have keystrokes for everything? That is by the way Um, that I'm not sure about. That's more of because I'm not a developer, but I think that um, there is a way to address that specifically because it's part of the functionality. So there is some compliance issue with that, but I'm not exactly sure, you know, what the rules are with, you know, with the actions because that is something that's very, very specific. So, but definitely something that, you know, your developers can address as well. I think I saw someone. Yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, my question is similar. Uh, and uh, this is, might be a slightly off topic because I don't work in the web world. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I write firmware for wearable technology. Mm -hmm. And so there, there's, I have a very tiny screen to work with, right? So tiny icons, things like that. And then sometimes like, we have to remove something Mm -hmm. uh, for something like that, I think providing some kind of textual um, alternative would be helpful. So even if you have just a link or something that they can click on or tab on for um, you know, to provide it some kind of description would be helpful. Okay. So that's like the, the quickest thing or that I can think of. Like, it's just, you know, when you, you always want, so the response to that would be, what would be my alternative, you know, to that? And that would be like a tech, more like a textual description would, the, would be helpful. Yeah, because then with that, that's something that can be read out through a third party, you know, device or whatever, like Bluetooth, you know, it can be read out to them. So that will be an alternative, okay. you know, so, you know, something to, that would be one way to address the situation, to address the issue. Thank you. 
No problem. Have any other questions? Anybody want to share some of the accessibility issues you might have run into in the past or currently experiencing or would like to see addressed in your, your workflow? Yeah. I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, Oh, oh. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I mean, so what, what has your experience been with that? Like what? Yeah, that <laughs> that would be kind of like a I want to say more like a collaborative thing, I think. Yeah. So that one that kind of got me something I have to go look into that and see. Yeah. Does anyone else have any comments, feedback? Yeah, helpful. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. That was all I had. Thank you. We can.